Is this it? Hey! Um, what's going on? Greetings, programs. Hanker and Fernail here, back once again with another awesome episode of Runehammer. How to play D&D like a big old badass, like a grown-ass man, or woman, or neither. Just be your own self. Because who the hell else is going to do it? Welcome back to a little series that uh, you may recall. It's not very popular. It's uh, formally and informally known as... <laughs> I've been procrastinating so much on this thing, trying to get a full mental grasp of it. I'm, procrastination is in an all-time maximum. It's at its all-time procrastinum. Procrastinum. But that time is over. I've had the design done for almost two weeks. Boo! Just been sitting on this bad boy. So you can see it's got eight total rooms. Six of them are these elemental rooms, which is what we're going to be talking about. And then I got my three T's set up for all of those rooms. Okay, that's all I need. Now I just need to do all the building. So to jump right into that, I've got this sort of baseboard or bottom board, floorboard here, which is sort of frozen ice or cold water on the bottom. And then you got your lava on the other side. So this way we can do fire and ice rooms. So what, what is all this? What, what kind of, what craziness is this? To do a dungeon design that would be for high level characters. And I know that high level characters can be an elusive thing in this game, but that could mean anywhere between, you know, sixth and seventh level up to more like in the high teens, right? Speaking in 5e terms. You're doing high level things. It doesn't have to be statistically high level, but I wanted the feel to be epic level action. The premise of the concept is that your heroes have come onto this sort of elemental plane. Perhaps it's a storm or a, an unstable area in the center of the mortal plane where everything is tearing up and spinning. A great storm is ripping the very core of your world to shreds because a dark lord or a powerful magician, whoever your dark villain may be, is actually trying to combine the elements of fire and ice into some new tertiary, tertiary some new arcane element that he's going to use to smite the world or even the universe. So he's bringing the elemental plane of ice and the elemental plane of fire together into this impossible looking spire or fortress that your heroes are now approaching. So their goal is to go to the fortress of fire and ice or the citadel of fire and ice, sounds cooler. Go in there and defeat the Dark Lord before he can merge these two elements and disrupt the sort of cosmic balance in the universe. A lot of my gameplay, your, uh, your heroes are kind of being smoked with the action, right? They're just trying to get through it. But in this case, they are the approachers. They're the attackers. They're going to come in and they need to take this guy down before he merges fire into ice. He's trying to cram them together, probably to awaken some sleeping god or something, right? Because that's what all cool adventures lead to. First we're going to build the entrance. Um, and really, if you have a fire looking set or a hell set, you have a little bit of stone and you have uh, an ice or snow set, you're going to be good to go on all this crafting. Remember, you can always use your 2D battle mat and be a total badass. It's all good. So the first room we're going to do is called the Great Hall. And it is not, it does not have a frozen floor. So we're going to get rid of that. It's, uh, it's a stone room and it's just the entrance design. Uh, is a classic in a lot of the Zelda games, which is one of your earliest rooms in your dungeon, also has the doorway to your boss. And so you go around this circuitous route to return to a doorway that you can then finally open. And so I did that same design, and we are going to do that design. So let's cut to hyper time, and let's get, um, let's get the Great Hall, which is the entrance to the Citadel of Fire and Ice. Let's get this baby built. All right, so we have the Great Hall built. It's a super simple little room, right? That's no big deal at all, but it gives you a reference point. And you might want to remake this toward the end of the adventure because they might come back to this, um, you know, at the end when they're ready to access the central door. Okay, so what is going on in the Great Hall? So they enter out of here. So you kind of heard my initial description. Your characters are somehow at the center of a sort of an elemental storm or, or one of your elemental planes, or maybe they're in sort of an area of your world that is this valley or this area of jagged rocks where all the trees have been stripped away. It could be any location that is handy for you. 
and then there's this fortress that is part fire, part ice, that's all this destabilization is all around it, and there's a big gate in the front to walk into. And so the heroes, being totally awesome, walk in there, and they are confronted with the Great Hall. So I don't really even need notes here because all this is is a presentation of the situation is sort of a way to think of it. And so what you have is you have an entrance. I have my two heroes here. I'm just going to do a, these are two super high level characters coming in with a magic user and a fighter. And you have this central platform. Then you have an ice door right here. So you're going to want to make or somehow come up with ice doors because this is going to be an ongoing theme. And then you've got your fire door. Again, going to be an ongoing theme. Then you have this big center door. So they come in and they're going to start investigating things and asking what's this and what's that. And the parts and pieces are very simple here. So first of all, you have this central platform. If you stand on the platform, you can communicate with the Dark Lord, but at a price. So for each like interaction or question and answer you have with the Dark Lord while you stand on this like... It's like Frodo putting on the ring, like you're in this crazy destabilized, hot, cold, crazy vortex while you're standing on this thing. And you can be like, you know, where are you? And it'll be like, I wait for you. And that'll cost you like weapon damage. So like you could do 1d6 damage just to have that little micro conversation. Quickly characters can fi figure out, well, let's decide exactly what we should ask him and then let's try again. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So you can try to trick some information out of the Dark Lord. Now the Dark Lord is a Dark Lord, so he's not just going to like give up all the goods, even with the most cleverly formulated questions. So be careful with this mechanic and play the Dark Lord believably. So if we, you investigate this uh, ice door, just being within a couple of clicks of it, it gets frighteningly cold. Like so cold, even if a character is to touch this doorknob, their fingers have a sort of 50-50 chance of sticking and losing some skin when you pull your hand off. It's like that cold. There's like mist coming off this door, but it is not locked. That's the key to remember. Same thing, so within two clicks of the heat door, they're gonna take minor heat damage just from radiant heat. And as they get closer, they realize like flames are just licking up the surface of this thing, but just like a, like a slime of fire just kind of running over it like this weird, whoa. So it's not locked, but to reach down and to turn the latch or to do the thing, it's going to like give you some minor burn damage on your hand. Now players always have creativity. They can use Vine Whip or something. They can have a stick with a claw on the end. They can have all kinds of solutions not to have to touch these things to open them. Well, what's this center door all about before we start making decisions? And this center door has this twin lock mechanism on here. Now I just use this because it's kind of big and I can see through it and I like it. But you have a huge door which is far bigger than a person. So even this isn't big enough, but you know, with terrain, you don't want things this tall. It can be quite cumbersome. So this huge door made for a huge person and down at, you know, like head level for a normal sized person, like right here, there are two keyholes and one of them is freezing cold and one of them is burning hot. I think we can all intuit what the puzzle is here. <laughs> Anyone who's played anything is gonna know, like your final boss room is gonna be right back here. Okay, so super simple. But it just gives things this nice intro. This is maybe 20, 30 minutes that characters are gonna spend in here. That's about it. The fire rooms, the ice rooms, there's six of them total. And then we'll do the Dark Lord's Hall at the end, okay? So let's just uh, jump into the first ice room to get started. And let's go to Hyper Time and get that first room built. Uh, that room is called the Shrine of Swords. Nikes. This is the Shrine of Swords. This is the first ice room. You may not be able to totally see, but here is our starting point, our entry point um, for, we can actually put an ice door where they come in, right there. We have the entrance down here now, the classic um, sort of architectural principle here is uh, this sort of indirect entry. So it gives you a little bit of a time to sort of introduce you. So you wouldn't have these two enemies out until your characters come around the bend here. So now look, let me look at my guide. So my timer is swords pressing in. Okay, so now we're gonna get into our mechanics just right away. So this room, the theme is these swords that sort of materialize and they could be made out of ice would be a cool explanation. They could be from a time of giants or something. But the idea is that this disappears. 
then you roll your d4, and in that much time, these swords are gonna be like, like that. And that's kind of your mechanic. You can just use your crafted sword and do this. And they should be big enough that then if they sweep, like, they cover a huge area of the board. So another sword like this goes like that. And then maybe they You know, you can be different every time. You can maybe roll 1d4 for what quadrant it lands in. But this is your fun Super Smash Mega Damage toy to play with in this room. Timer is just in, uh, like surviving this damn thing. So if it like, you know, you roll a one on your quadrant and these guys are in the engine corridor, then the thing is just like <laughs> Now your threat is obviously your swords, your steel guardians, and your cold. So I have two steel guardians here. These are Darkest Dungeons minis. But these are like heavily armored giant oversized skeletons. The idea being there are these two guardians and they guard sort of this part of the room. Um, so the cold now is the real threat and the real interesting mechanic here. And this is where the whole fire and ice, fire and ice mechanic is gonna get fascinating for you. Is they're gonna move through here, right? It's a couple of moves just to get to this near door, right? And it's like, oh look, another ice door. Hmm. By the time they even get to this door, just to walk a couple of moves, it's so stinking cold that they're going to start a taking cold damage, losing movement speed, and certain abilities and other things are going to start being debilitated. So like metal is going to start sticking. So armor is going to be more sort of clumsy and difficult and you're going to lose your like dex bonus entirely if you're wearing armor. Um, Non-magical weapons are going to become too frosty and brittle and so they're going to have a chance of cracking on usage. Uh, you're going to need dex checks to not slide and bump into the wall just right here in this entry area, they should get this feeling like there's no way we can be in the cold for a prolonged amount of time. That's key to realize. Now, if they don't fully realize it and they say, we're not that interested in this whole thing, we just want to go through the freebie door because it is right here and it's not locked. They can just run right through this door and evac. Then you just need a little bit of a mental picture of this board in case you need to rebuild it later. But this series of rooms can be moved through in different sequence. So, Technically, they don't have to do this stuff. All right, there's that. Thing is, if they go through the ice door right away, they're gonna go into, because it's an ice door, another ice room, and the cold is really going to set in. So the clue you wanna give them, as they're up here considering this door and then looking through this opening, kinda like, what is going on in there? Back here behind, you can kinda see my line of sight. Back here behind the Shrine of Swords, this sort of altar, where this magic sword, maybe it's a single sword that's like spectrally contained here or a, a, a magical, you know, like a titan sword from back in the day that is like imprisoned here that has a will of its own. Behind that shrine back there, they can see one of these, these uh, fire doors licking with fire and heat and all around it, like the ice is thawed and that should look like, like hope. <laughs> like, so my treat is there's a loot bonanza, which is in a treasure chest right back here that you can see, and the fire door itself is the treat because it's the only source of heat. So this is gonna be a mechanic that's gonna recur in all of your fire and ice rooms is to get relief from the environment, you need to go into the alternate environment and that's why they crisscross, okay? So if you guys come in, they're freezing cold and right away they're like, oh my God, this cold is nuts. We're gonna use up all our spells resisting it really quickly. Like we need some source of heat and like they try to make a little fire and it just goes out. Like only magical fire will burn. If they go through this door, you've gotta hit them hard with cold damage and cold effects in the next cold room. They should not be able to withstand without extensive magic capability, two cold rooms in a row. Especially once an enemy who is completely acclimated to this cold, has no bad effects from it, um, sees them and starts attacking. So they can go through this door, but then they get so stinking cold that it's going to be very difficult to maintain. Same thing with fire rooms, just like in Metroid, right? If you're in a fire level too long, you just start taking mad fire damage unless you have your various suit. So if you want to, maybe deeper in the dungeon, provide some protective equipment, that could be cool too. But this is the, the game you're going to play, is this balance of fleeing one element into the other and fleeing that element into the previous. Okay, so as long as you get that mechanic in your head, you can improvise a lot of these room contents in different ways.
Let's assume they realize that we got to get to the fire. So they start making moves. One of them slips and slides. These two guys come, oh, you can't be in here. Be gone or a master will kill you. No, no, oh, we're gonna fight these guys. It's too cold to fight them. I'm gonna make a run for it. Opportunity attack, almost die. Get to the fire door. Oh crap, now I'm tanking both of them? This is nuts, I'm gonna go this way. Then timer runs out. You know, massive sword damage. And the fighter like barely survives it only because he's a fighter. Oh crap. I'm gonna just gonna jump for the door, I need heat. Ah, Midair, he's like half frozen. And then he heats up and thaws by the door. We make our stand here, because it's warm. Rah, and here come these guys. And then another timer runs out on the sword and it comes down. You know, oh, I missed us barely. And then this guy comes over. Oh crap, okay, we killed him, he's taken care of. More fighting, I'm gonna light my sword on fire. Ah, it does double damage because he's so acclimated to the cold. Ah, geez. No, and then another sword. Oh crap, ah, I hit him. Ah, ha, ha, ha. So he's killed. We only have a few moments before the next sword comes in. Here, grab that chest. So then they loot the chest. They're mucking around with the chest. And what do they find in the chest but a key? Now, which key it is, is totally up to you. It could be the ice key, screw it, whatever, just give them the ice key. The reason that you wanna put this in one of the first rooms, or it could be the first fire key, who knows? You can mix it up however you want, but it probably makes the most sense to have the ice key in here and a couple of nice pieces of loot. First of all, you're welcoming them to the difficulty level and you wanna encourage them. This is gonna be fun, guys, here's some stuff. Secondly, you want, them to make, you want to make them think they're kinda of halfway done. We're just gonna get the other key and we'll be ready to go, but you're gonna put the other key way at the end. So, I know, it's super cruel, but it does give that Pavlovian effect of like, keep going. Oh, look, you got a little food pellet. Here you go, boop, you got the key. You guys are great. So, the last fun thing is for either of the keys, fire or ice, the elementality of it should be so powerful. Like the cold of the ice key is so cold. The characters need a magical way to carry this thing around. It is not carryable by normal means. If you put it in a satchel, the satchel will freeze solid, it'll freeze to your hip, your leg will stop functioning, you'll be cold wherever you go, it'll probably like melt the flesh off your thigh or something horrible. So you need a magical way to contain elementality of this strength. And that should be a fun sort of mechanic. Maybe they put it on the end of a chain and they drag the chain around if they don't have a bag of holding or a quiver of Ilona or something to that effect. So there you go, there's the first room, the Shrine of Swords. Now we're gonna just wipe this baby and we're going to do uh, ice room number two, which is the Frigid Tomb. Now the Frigid Tomb is pretty straightforward. Um, and you know, a lot of these ideas, I got just sort of my stem ideas out of Oath of the Frozen King by Absolute Tabletop. But Frigid Tomb is really a similar room in a lot of ways. It's just an enemy heavy room without so much mechanical stuff and a lot more squiggle. So let's just do that room, okay? So let's go into hyper time and uh, let's make the Frigid Tomb. Frigid Tomb next. So. As you can see, both from uh, building in hyper time as well as this view, you're really looking at, starting place, you're looking at a sort of maze-like randomized space, okay? This is a really fun space. You wouldn't have all these enemies laying around. Those have to be discovered, right? But basically what you're gonna play with this mechanic is an accidentally wake up the dead. So the theme of this room is that there is a tomb where all of the servants of the Dark Lord are all frozen into the ground and frozen into the walls and there are countless dead. Now I'm not gonna fill the whole board with dead to show that, but they're all sort of frozen. Any proximity to a living thing is going to thaw them and wake them up, okay? So that's your first little piece. Then for my timer threat and treat, okay? So my timer is the freezing fog. Now you could use a big blob of, um, of cotton, would totally work. Uh, just for the sake of, of doing it right now, I have these sort of uh, tidal wave minis and they would just sort of slide around like this. So anything within say three or four clicks of one of these fogs is going to be frozen solid for 1d4 rounds, okay? Or you can make it one round if you wanna be a little gentler or whatever's gonna fit your table. But basically the, the frozen fog is always moving. It's always drifting around in this room and anything it touches Without, and if you want to make it you know, a little easier, you can give a con save, maybe a hard con save or a high DC con save. But anything that that fog encounters, frozen solid. And so what you want to do is force movement through with your characters so that they are 
navigating these corpses that are frozen into the floor and frozen into the walls. So you see the idea. As long as you get the fundamental ideas, you can improvise the spaces in all kinds of different ways. But the idea is that the fog will keep them from just choosing one path and going that way. They're going to have to kind of go and double back and maybe go over here and kind of look around. And in the process of doing that, they're going to wake up a lot of enemies. Now, these enemies are not going to be as tough as the guardians in the previous ice room in the sort of uh, the Shrine of Swords. Um, these are going to be more like just high level kind of, you know, dim-witted undead. Um, so again, they'll be immune to the cold because they're sort of part of this, but they want the heat of the living. <sighs> Consider them like enemy landmines. Now, even if, you know, I'll, I'll move this wall just so you can see. So there's one right there. So even if the heroes come walking right near one of these frozen corpses, they could theoretically with stealth and with going, you know, giving enough room around it, avoid waking the thing up. So you can do use any series of rolls you can think of to measure heat, to measure stealth, to measure noise, all kinds of things to see if each corpse wakes up, or you can make it a 50-50, you can make it harder than that. But the fun of it is, is the players should feel the agency where they're not just guaranteed to step on all the enemy landmines, right? That, that's bad. They should be able to avoid some of them, um, unless they like break into a run, in which case if they break into a run, they're guaranteed to just make a bunch of noise and stumble over these things and wake them up. Okay, so the, the peril of the room is really gonna be a mechanic. Now, if they had already been in an ice room previously, they are going to be so stinking cold in here, so cold. And so that might lead to some running because they might you might let them see with a high perception check or scouting check that there is a glow of fire at this sort of far end of the room. But the journey here is not only circuitous, it's got all these enemy landmines. There's also this possible route. And you know how players are. Anytime there's more than one choice, the choosing becomes time consuming. And like time is the enemy here because not only is it cold, this fog is going. And they see that fog at first, like as they're rounding this corner and they already woke this corpse up. They're fighting this thing. This fog is blowing in. You can see very quickly how it escalates. Have your cool um, Chessex dice case frozen solid block on hand. And you can do that, put that right on top of a mini in case that the fog makes contact. Now let's say your entire party is frozen solid. That is not a wipe because you're gonna thaw in a few rounds and reappear. So you could have a point where combat sort of ends and this corpse kind of wanders off and refreezes because there's no threat. Everyone is frozen solid. The fog blows away. The characters thaw and they're like, oh crap. And you do some cold damage to them, but they're still there. And it's an interesting situation because you can have a, a semi-wipe going on. And they start exploring. The fog is pushing them around, forcing them to go this way. They wake this guy up. Now they got two zombies to fight. They're moving through. Oh, let's try going this way. I'm going to get up on here and maybe we could use some high ground. Oh, whoops. We woke up another one. Ah, there's a fire door right over there. We got to get out of this cold. Okay, well, there's another corpse between us and there. And then... Oh wait, the fog is near the fire door. That's not good, it's kind of blocking our path. Well, let's try to go back here. No, the fog is back there. Oh crap, let's go this way. We're still being pursued by these guys. Like, this is quite a room. He's dead. I'm getting out of here, the fog blew away. Crap, catch up with me. I can't, it's too cold, I'm starting to freeze. My armor's all messed up. Which way is the thing? I don't know, my perception failed thing happened tonight. Oh, there it is over there, okay. Doo -doo -doo. Head for it, oh no. And then this guy wakes up from the noise. Oh, we got another battle. How about this way? No, it's a dead end. Oh crap, I'm so stinking cold, I can't function. I've used up all my spells. Let's get through here. Okay, they find a way to dig through. Boom. Fire door, screw the next ice room. Let's get out of here, which is what they should be saying. If they don't want to go into fire room two and they're just set on being in the ice, maybe they have some super uber powered ice resistance gear that's making this cold pressure not so bad. Then there's the next ice door there to ice room three. But remember, the sort of fundamental mechanical pressure here is to get them to alternate rooms. So even though I'm presenting uh, the fire and ice rooms to you guys in some order in this video, the order should be completely up for negotiation. And the order should be what kind of makes the revelation of this dungeon interesting. Okay, so we had some more undead here that never got woke up, and you should expect that to happen. Um, this may not be enough either. That might be one little cluster. Maybe you want to throw dozens of undead at them rather than a few here and there. And that would be another fun way to do it. Just make them sort of more mooky so they have, you know, like five hit points rather than 15. Uh, and maybe 1d6 instead of 1d12 damage, you know, like I would maybe do bigger guys so they have 1d12 pikes and they have 10 uh, hit, hit points. 
because then you know you're more of a threat to a higher level character. You can do it any number of ways. Um, how you do the fog, you can do different speeds on it. You can actually have a wind blowing through here, a little bit of a breeze to indicate where the fog's coming next. You can improvise all kinds of fun stuff. So that is the frigid tomb. Now, next we're going to do the crystal gateway, which is an interesting room because it's almost a way out of the ice area without going into the fire area because it's the end of the ice area. So remember, the order could be anything and that makes things very interesting and weird. Okay, so let me clean up my mess and then we're gonna go into hyper time and I'm going to build the crystal gate. Now, if also you didn't like giving them the ice key early and you wanna keep driving them, you can always put the ice key in any of these rooms that you feel good about. So if you wanna make them do all three ice rooms, you can put it in the crystal gate, which is the next one. And uh, that way you're sort of guaranteed to get this sort of amount of exploration. Okay, so let's go to hyper time and build the crystal gate. Now we've got the crystal gate here. So uh, let's get our heroes. And here's our entrance right down here. Now you guys may you know, somewhat recognize this layout that came from another one of my uh, ice dungeons that I did, which kind of felt like this kind of big hall that led up to a, a very clear confrontation. So you're, you're not doing indirect architecture. You're just openly saying, you know, whoa, check it out. There's freaking the Ice King right up there. So this is taken right out of Oath of the Frozen King. I just like the idea. I figure why not play with it. So one of the Dark Lord's servants is this kind of Ice King character. So half the fun of the design of this room is who is he? What can he do? What are his powers? That could be anything. I leave all that up to you. So you can draw that material from any number of awesome books that you may have. Uh, come up with it in, in any number of way. It could be Lord Soth for crying out loud. Okay, so they have this corridor, and then you have these ice crystals, right? And these are awesome little crystals that were made for me by Rocket Pig Games. Um, but you guys can make them out of all kinds of cool little things. But you want these really bright blue crystals, and then you have this gateway up here. Now over here you have another fire door, but that's not going to be visible, really. And you cannot have it on the board until they sort of scout that back corridor. But that's going to be basically a, a critical way out or it might be how they enter. So that's one thing that when you look at my, um, my final design here, which you know, I have this picture up maybe throughout the video or at the end, you can see like why these doors are so clutch is they let the players move around between these rooms in different ways. Okay, so how about the three T's? What's going on here in the gateway, the, the crystal gate? So first of all, the timer is that this portal is overloading and the, basically the rage or the anger of this guy, maybe he's imprisoned here, um, is arcing in this magical energy and this gateway, which you can see, you know, magically in there like a hologram, you can see the Great Hall, which is the entrance to the entire dungeon, remember? That's visible through this gateway, but it's like arcing and staticky and unstable. And you want to roll something like maybe a D8 timer or just say it's six rounds or say it's eight rounds until this thing destabilizes and is destroyed. Whoa, if it's destroyed, their only way out of here is either back or through this fire door. And that is going to cost them potentially more danger time and more journey time, whereas this could get them to a restable space. Next, you've got your threat. You've got what I call the doorman. <laughs> it's basically the Frozen King. So he's up here and he doesn't want you to use this portal because for magical reasons, he's not allowed to go through there. It's, it's teasing him and it makes him angry. And so he's gonna say, I'm gonna freaking kill you. You know, you'll never reach the Dark Lord. I'm the Lord of Ice in this realm. I have committed myself to fuse with the Lord of Fire and we will become one and the world will suffer. The threat is the Arcing Crystals. One of the abilities that he has, or you can make it an environmental capability that's just happening naturally. These crystals arc in straight lines like this. It's like an M shape or a W shape. And anything in that linear space is going to be suffering from like a lightning bolt spell or the equivalent of a lightning bolt spell. And these will arc every, say, one to two rounds or one to four rounds, depending on how deadly you want to be. And what it's going to do is force your characters into having these like forbidden areas and yet manage the movement. So, and it's got to be brutal. Do a high level lightning bolt spell between these crystals. The crystals can be destroyed. If the crystals are destroyed, the arcs will now be erratic, but they will still connect. So they'll go through here and they could blow this door apart. Now that's your new arc. 
You see what I'm saying? So the worst one to destroy would be this one. Because now the arc is going to go zzz, zzz, and it's going to be this entire space here is going to be... You see what I mean? So some of the geometry of the danger of the room is character configurable or is even utilizable against the king. So I would make the arcs, if you're trying to relieve some of your deadliness, they'll affect um, the king, the doorman, as I like to call him. Finally, your treat. We do have a loot box out back here, thank goodness. So your loot box, if you're mean, can, can contain the, uh, the ice key. You can make them wait all this way to get it. Or you could just put some nice loot in there. Maybe it's the stash of the doorman where he keeps some of his gear. The other treat, once again, fire door. Fire door, very useful for people freezing their butts off. Okay, so they come forward, da da da. They see the, the crystal arcing and they're like, whoa, how are we gonna deal with this? And well, screw this thing. Ah, and they start picking at it. And he says, why are you destroying that? Ah, and then they manage to destroy it quickly and they get that scenario we described, which is not good, which is you could pick. It could either go this way, it could go that way, it could go through here. We're gonna say like that, it destroys this. Somebody says, ah, take cover back there. Hey, look, there's a fire door. Oh, that's cool, but I see a rest space up there. Let's get to that. No way, I'm gonna fight you. Da, da, da. epic battle, epic battle, epic battle, but then you can't stand here. So the battle has to move. So well, let's take some cover, come on. Do, 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 do. Why did you go that way? You're such a dumb fighter. Hey, wait, scouting roll, look back there. I think I see a chest. Okay, more fighting. Oh crap, the bee got, oh, he's not gonna like that. So then they destroy this. Whoa, now the arc is gonna go this way. So it hits him again, it destroys this piece. Now this is opening up. Whoa, I'm gonna go get the chest. You keep him busy. Okay, da, da, da. hey, look, loot. Oh, nice, it's a vorpal sword. Well, no, no, no. Okay, well, I, I'm freezing my butt off. We either gotta get out of here or go to the fire door. Well, that thing's destabilizing. How long does it have? I don't know, just barely long enough. Psh, da, da, da. We're not gonna defeat this guy. Screw it. Run. I'm jumping. No, don't leave me behind. Zzz, disappears. Fighters, every time. Just me, stuck alone with this guy. He comes up. He's, he's gonna cast Banish or something terrible on him. Like the whole game is resting right here. This could be a character wipe. No, he makes the save, jumps through the portal, and then one round later, that's one possible scenario. <laughs> so there you go. So that is the final ice room, is the crystal gate. Okay, so you're just playing your crystal mechanic. You've got your loot to discover, your fire door possibly to use, and your doorway back to a rest point. There you go. Now remember, these rooms are not in this order per se. I'm just introducing them in this order, so the order could be crazy. All right, so that's it for the three ice rooms. Now we're going to do the three fire rooms. So I'm gonna clean up a little bit and let's go back into hyper time and build the first fire room, which I believe is called the Halls of the Dead. So this is where we're really gonna take the undead element to the limit with a kind of a hell feel to things in the realm of fire. Okay, so let's jump on in. All right, wow. Now it's gonna get a little crazy. So welcome to the Halls of the Dead. This is the first fire room. So remember, you wanna do a few things here. You wanna introduce fire mechanics and you wanna you know, keep the, the party rolling as far as alternating between ice and fire. We have heat upon heat upon heat. That's the timer here. So. Play the heat game, right? Start to soften metal, make metal unbearable, catch some paper or cloth things on fire, um, do low level damage, let people with heat resistant gear feel cool for once, or dragon made gear. Um, try all kinds of things like this. Make uh, perception extremely difficult at long range because of heat distortion. Also, the heat can actually, these two fragments can actually be moving in this molten lake slightly over time because the heat is so bad. Right, so at a certain time, this uh, crossing right here is the only way to cross. It's gonna be a lot harder than at a certain other time like this, and you could play with that. Okay, so that's your timer. Um, your threat is the ash skeletons, and also we're gonna have a trap over here. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But first of all, you have these ash skeletons. So these are the legions of the dead, which I just took from my, my zombie side set. Um, and I only use the sort of the gray ones uh, because you know I did color coding in my zombie side. But even this I wouldn't say is quite enough. So as they were killing through some of them, I would recycle some of the killed ones to make more and more crowds of these things and really press the crowd mechanic. Now if you haven't run crowd combat, just think of each one as sort of one hit point or maybe two hit points to make it a little more interesting. And then also people working on getting multiple hits at a time so that you get a single melee type target fighter 
becomes very ineffective and then you need like a cleave type maneuver or a chain attack, then you want to start using things like fireballs and area attacks and it just changes things. It's running a swarm. You're going to run a swarm of undead in here. So when these two masses of stone are floating at the right distance, this can be crossed. So first they fight their way through all these zombies, right? And that's the circuitous path. So you get a lot of nice distance out of this one little fragment of rock. Then they come over here, but just their appearance here is gonna cause all these dead to pile forward onto the landing spot for this jump. And it's going to be near impossible, right? They're all going, Ugh. So here's where the players need to solve this first puzzle. How do we jump across with all these guys waiting on the far side? You could either blow them up, you could shoot them one by one with arrows, but they just keep coming and coming and coming, right? So they figured it out. I mean, it's just a classic kind of enemy uh, combat puzzle. So Halls of the Dead, uh, then my treat. Okay, yeah. So they're fighting, they're fighting. Huh, they kill enough of these guys. Ooh, okay, great. I'll kind of keep them over here as my, as my DM. And uh, ah, he fell in the lava and he's burned to cinders. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, we killed just enough of them to make a little gap here. Make the jump, I got it. Okay, ooh, I failed my dex check. Ah, oh, vine lash. Okay, ooh, that was close. I almost fell in the lava. That would have basically killed me instantly. Oh, wouldn't you have that dragon scale helmet you've been wearing? Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. Oh, more, more zombies. Ooh, hey, relief from the heat. Here's the ice door. Should we go into the ice room or should we keep going? I don't know. Ooh, look, there's a chest. Hey, I'm gonna get this chest over here and kill this zombie. Great, okay, there's stuff in there. No key here, save the fire key for the third fire room. They're going, oh, hey, cool, there's some loot. There's so many zombies crowding around the ice door, maybe we can't get there. Or maybe you build your geometry slightly different so your ice door is like back here, harder to reach. Whatever. So they keep attacking. Remember, you can do these any way you want. It's just understanding the basics is what gets you the fun rooms. So you keep going, the monsters are just, but then they come around and you probably can't see very well, so we're gonna remove this wall so you can see. So as you come around this bend, you have your final threat, which is a trap. Okay, so as they approach, and here's the fire door, because they're gonna go, they, they, can, they can deal with fire a lot better than cold, so they're gonna go to the next fire room. Or they already did the ice rooms, and so they don't wanna go there again, so they have to go in here. Who knows what combination of rooms are gonna happen, right? So, whoo, they have to go there, but look, these zombies are all acting weird. They're all like waiting right over there. What's going on? Well, I don't know, I'm gonna kill them, Rah! And then right here, this whole area of floor is rigged with spring-loaded spikes of doom, like that. So the zombies knew it, and they're all keeping their distance, and now our fighter is neck deep in chest-high spikes. Ah! Oh crap, he's down. What am I gonna do? Oh no, they're coming up from behind me now. Oh, and there's like more zombies like crawling out of the lava, like on fire and stuff, these black skeletons and gray ash-covered corpses. And oh my God, they're close. This is not cool. This is not good at all. Well, I gotta get my fighter up. Okay, my fighter's up. Let's fight here a little bit. Okay, we killed a few more of these, but they're gonna keep coming, dude. We gotta get past these spikes somehow. Well, let's just kind of carefully go through them and then zombies start like spitting at them and throwing their arms at them and stuff. This whole ordeal to get across these spikes finally gets resolved. They kill enough of these zombies finally. Good lord, that took, that was a hellish effort. No pun intended, totally intended. Then they go across, oh, kill more of these zombies. This one, ah, falls off into the lava. Finally get to the fire door. They figure out a way to open without burning their hands off. Maybe they shove a zombie into it and fry him into ashes on the fire door, kick open the fire door, and bang, they're in the next room. Okay? So, this is not the mechanically the most complex room, but there's a lot going on as far as just getting through it and battling all these zombies and also setting tone. Remember, not everything has to be behold my game design skills. Some of it can just be, whoa, that was really cool, right? And to me, that's kind of the, the function of this room. It's just, it's really fun to fight a big crowd of zombies like that and feel like a total badass. Okay, so that is the first one. The next one is the Burning River, okay? So we're really gonna take this kind of rocks floating in lava concept to a higher level in the Burning River. And uh, the puzzle of the Burning River, a lot of it is just like sort of getting through. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, 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 this next one's crazy. Okay, so let's go to Hyper Time and let's build the Burning River, which is really gonna make use of this, uh, this lava baseboard, which is something I've been kinda excited to try. Now we have the Burning River. Man, this is a lot of rooms, this is crazy. Um, okay, so starting point for our heroes is down here, coming through the Fire Door 2. Right, they're on that tiny little island and this massive river of magma is right here. And if you want, you can use a timer 
or just sort of be somewhat arbitrary to slightly change some of these distances right over time. This whole place is, is plastic in a way. All right. First of all, you got your timer. This lava level is rising. So it's going to rise a lot. And when it rises a lot, it goes and then sinks back down. And anything of this height, these three will be, will be covered. Yes. So right away they need to get off of there and they've got a big jump to, to do it. And how are they going to make it happen? I don't know. This is up to the players to figure out. Maybe they just go back the way they came. This is too hard. That is completely possible. <laughs> but remember, this could ebb slightly toward them like that and become maybe makeable. Maybe they have a, an object, maybe they have a spell, maybe they have something, put them to the test. And then after X rounds, they can only think about it because these three objects, these three islands are gonna be submerged in lava. That's your first piece, okay? Second piece is your threat. Blink demons. This is again from my uh, Darkest Dungeon miniature set. It's this abominable, quadrupedal, tentacle-faced, fang, ten crazy, multi-eyed horror thing, okay? So, this thing is such a troll. Basically, you can have three of these in your queue, right? But only one of them is gonna be out at any one time. And this has blink capability, and it has like a 100-foot teleport. So this thing just goes whoosh, 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 whoosh. So you see, it's basically made for this environment. It's a lot like the Moloch boss fight, right, where he's warping around. This thing is a nightmare to confront while you're trying to move across this room. And that's it. That's all you need. Okay, so you've got the blink demon. And then your treat is what I was calling shard stones. Okay, so maybe we should... I know that these two are shard stones. But maybe we can add a few by the ice door and we're going to add one here. Okay, so the shard stones, when you discover these things, you realize the, the blink, the blink demon, it hates these things. It, it will appear anywhere in this area and not want to be near it. Right? It'll appear over here and then very quickly like back up to here. So it can't go within like two clicks, let's say, of the shard stones. Now what are they? I don't know. Maybe some druid put them here. Maybe they're a remnant of the fortress that used to be here before the lava was unnaturally conjured. But anyways, they provide just a little, you can't get me. So um, that's a shard stone. You can make, even make a huge one a shard stone. So it'd be like almost like a base. So it's kind of stuck right here. And so this is its limitation to its mobility. It can move all at once, but it doesn't like these things. It's not magically repelled from them. Like it can get within, you know, it can get like that, but it doesn't like them. It's like, it's ah, uber, uber simple. Because what I wanted to do is put this room on the players. I wanted to say, yo, how are you gonna do this? Like, do you have a fly spell? Do you have a wish? Do you have a rock feather? Do you have boots of lava walk? Do you have teleportation spell? What, who knows? But maybe they can even retrieve a shard stone and move it with them so that they can Maybe you only have one shard stone like this, whoops. And they retrieve this thing and they realize that this thing hates it and they use it to repel the thing and they're sort of flying from space to space and then it, it gets sick of it and it destroys the shard stone and now they have to battle it and they have to rush through the fire door or they take the ice door, which is the treat in the room because you can get relief from heat damage. Here's another shard stone. That's it. So you can improvise how the shard stones, the blink demon, maybe you don't just do one blink demon like I did. Maybe you have two or three of them. These are just skelly guys, but you get the point. And maybe where they blink isn't entirely like free will. Maybe they have like a pattern that they run or maybe maybe they're, they're sort of trapped in some pattern from an ancient battle that they're playing out again and again. Maybe they're spectral in a way or who knows, maybe where they move determines the momentum of some of these objects. So you can kite them lure them and it'll cause this to like float because of the momentum when it lands here. You see what I'm saying? So that this can all change. There's so many possibilities. What I just want to do is introduce the ideas to you guys, a couple of mechanical ideas, and then between you and the players, who knows what the hell's going to happen. So my heroes find a way across over to here. The timer runs out. They got to get over here. They use their one teleport spell right up to this bad boy and they're like battling this blink demon, which then blinks back here because it's losing, because enemies always lose. And then they're like, okay, well shit, now what do we do, dude? And then this thing starts spitting acid at him from across the way, ha <laughs> ha And they're like, well, I think I can make this jump. Yeah, Oh, he kind of got his feet in there and took 26 damage, but he's still alive. Okay, well now what? I don't know, I got a rope here. Shimmy, 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 shimmy. Okay, great, oh wait, no, here it comes. No, it's jumping down on our thing. Oh, we're running out of time here, quick. 
Use your rock feather, Ca-ca! down here, and then right then the timer in the lava eats up the blink demon. Oh crap! And then another one like skulks up around the stones. No crap! We gotta get out of here. This is not cool. But we can't survive another fire room. Oh crap! Well, we need to get over to that ice door then. Oh uh, well, no, forget it. Let's just do our room and through. Okay, wow. I really get on a roll when I do that part. Okay, so we only have one more fire room. And uh, that is what I'm calling the magma core. So that's kind of a bit of a, a play on words with the old molten core from Warcraft. But the magma core is the heart of the fire area. And so let's build that room in hyper time. And then at the end of that one, we're going to get the fire key. And then we get to go to the final room finally, which is just like, whoa, here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. So let's go into hyper time and build that. This gets a little crazy here. Okay, so this is the sort of the center of the firepower that the Dark Lord is harnessing for his, his fusion of the elemental powers of fire and ice. Here's our starting, pl uh, starting place with our heroes right over here, and they come into this highly complicated environment. Now, all of this is not gonna be visible. It needs to be revealed as they move through, especially this. This is the door back to the Great Hall. Remember, that's where rest awaits. This is the ice door into ice room three, um, the crystal gate, right? So you could enter through here in theory and like zip right over here, but the fire key is inside the, what's it called? The heat mech. So there's this machine here. So we're gonna get to that, but if the fire key is part of him and you can actually see it like on his forehead, like a sigil. So you come in, what are the parts and pieces? First of all, the timer is this exhaust. Okay, so there are three places that exhaust is gonna go every N rounds, right? And it's out of machinery. So you have machinery here, here, and here. And you could do the radius with a roll. You could do all kinds of improv, but basically anytime you're near machinery, every N amount of time it just goes when there's this big cloud which limits visibility, it's toxic, it reveals the invisible, it does all kinds of bad stuff because this hot smoke just comes bellowing out, okay? So there's your timer. That's gonna be bothering you the whole time, making you go crazy. Another element of timer, if you wanted to do, was activation for the heat mech itself. He could actually be going Okay. Um, the threat, we have drone spiders and the heat mecha. Now I know you see all these priests here, but they're not really a threat. So the drone spiders are these little tiny mechanical spiders that are running around cleaning up mechanical detritus, repairing loose bolts and so on and so forth, and you know, repairing little wires and doing little tasks. But they will, if de 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 detecting a threat, they will move in as a smaller enemy. I've got three of them on the board. You could easily have 12 of them on the board. Just depends on kind of how far you want to take things. The other threat, obviously the heat mech. The heat mech does not move. It's like built into this sort of four-pronged crazy platform thing right here. And it draws energy from these other stones and it's just sitting there and basically generating heat and focusing and harnessing heat. You can give it all kinds of cool attacks like fire bursts, fire ball, a ring that comes out. Maybe it picks one person and immolates them. Maybe it hits a thing on the ground and like these striations and markings in the ground actually light up with heat and it can do all kinds of great stuff. Shoot like tracer missiles and all kinds of stuff. Just unleash hell with this thing, but it doesn't move. That's the key. The priests are here and they're all trying to contain the heat mech. So they will not fight because they cannot break their work. Their job is to keep this thing from moving. They need him here so that he can harness the power of fire to make this whole grand spell that the Dark Lord is casting work. So they're all going, hum, nada, bay, nada, chung, nada, boom, nada, fire, nada, contain, hum, nada, gouda, 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 right? So that's what they're doing. So if you kill, all of them, this guy will be able to move. And you should realize these guys are kind of your friends in a weird way. They should have one hit point and they don't fight. So they're just an odd mechanical presence. You can't get too clumsy with your combat. You don't want them to all get incinerated. This guy starts moving, it's gonna get crazy, okay? Now, other stuff. Your treat is you have a door to the Great Hall, you have an ice door, and I would allow a mechanically inclined player to loot some of the machinery here to make something crazy for their character. That could be really interesting. 
Um, so now what else do we have going on? You have this kind of these little walls that you're probably noticing, which don't seem to serve a lot of structural purpose. But if you're going to do all these massive AOE spells with the heat mecha, these are really handy line of sight blockers. So you can hide back here, heat mecha sends out a wave, and maybe, you know, the, the priests, it's such that they don't get hit with his AOE spells, but they'll get hit with yours. Maybe that would be an interesting one. Maybe they're part of their casting. Maybe if there's three or less of them, they start to get hit with his spells and things get really bad. All kinds of variations are possible. Maybe they're completely immune. Maybe they're not even there. Maybe they're like specters that are like ghostly that can be hurt with magic weapons and so on and so forth. Who knows? You can do it a million ways, but I think it's fun that they're keeping him from moving and they're not really your enemy, but they're not really your friend either. So anyways, these three blocks of rock are here to serve as line of sight blockers. There's one catch. If you're using this one, it's right next to this huge chunk of machine with this huge screw that's turning, and that's gonna let off exhaust. So this is gonna be a dangerous place to hide from an AOE, and so that could be an element that comes into play. So they need to make their way up here, and most importantly, they need to steal that key off the forehead of the mech. <laughs> I think this is an interesting variation because you don't just need to kill this guy. What you really need is your rogue character to be able to ninja up, grab the key off there successfully, and do a triple backflip back here and get back to the Great Hall. Unless your ice key is in ice room number three, then you need to go through that door. And understanding that and figuring that out is critical to understanding and playing the whole dungeon. That's where the six room design really hits the road, is especially at this decision point. It's huge. So we're done there. So now we need to go into hyper time for the final room, which is the boss. So basically the Dark Lord is assembling these two elements to form this sort of beam to awaken the Elder God, and that's always what's happening, right? And so let's go into hyper time and build that final room, which is gonna be a little bit simpler than all this crazy stuff, okay? So join me right in there. Fire and Ice, this is the realm of the Dark Lord, or the Dark Lord's Hall, or the Conjuring Chamber. You could call it all kinds of things. Whoa! So the minute you walk in here, so you come through the Fire and Ice door through the Great Hall, because you went and got both keys through that whole ordeal of all six rooms, right? You open it up, you come through right here, here's our heroes, and they come in on this scene, which is in progress. So you have the Elder God, which I am using my awesome Cthulhu from Cthulhu Wars as this, it is materializing right here on this crazy altar. And behind it, this portal is empowering, and Cthulhu, or the Elder God, or whoever you're going to use, Narlotep, whatever, <laughs> he isn't quite 100% material yet. He's materializing. And you have all these green priests down here who are bringing him in and they're all absorbing like fire and ice power like from the walls and the ceiling and these little vents and the combination of fire and ice is powerful enough inside this portal here to actually materialize the elder god soon this thing is going to be complete and you're going to have to deal with fighting him maybe your players are up to that maybe they're not maybe he's just going to smash out of here and go start to ruin the world and get bigger and bigger who knows but you don't want that to happen that's a bad. Next, you have the room to deal with, okay? So what's going on in this room? Let's break it down. So I've got one other timer at play, which you can see I have my spike trap here on the floor. And this is really just an abstract way of me indicating spikes are up. This entire area, besides the very front row where the priests are, this contained by these walls, is a spike floor, okay? So you can make a bigger prop if you wanted, but I just show that as an indicator. Every blah rounds, these spikes all go whoosh. Keeps them from just doing a frontal approach, but does give them a window to do some stuff. They can always run on top of these walls as well. Who knows? Okay, so what's the real angle here? Next, we got the threat. We have the Servants of Darkness. We have Arcs from the Portal. And then we have the Isolation Portals. Okay, so we're going to talk about this stuff. So the Servants of Darkness are these guys around here. The fun of this is one of these guys, there's six of them in this setup, is the Dark Lord. And he is actually a high-powered magic user. But they all look identical and you can't tell who it is. So... This is kind of get a little bit interesting because you kind of want to get in here. You're going to kill these guys. Let's say you smack this guy with an arrow right at the beginning of the battle. 
it's to no avail. The only reason these other guys are here is to hide where the, the Dark Lord is. Okay, so you have that happening. Then you have portal arcs. So this thing is so much power building up in it. It's actually going to arc to metallic objects. So as you enter, you start to realize none of these priests or even this whole space has any metal on it except the spikes in the floor and these metal components to the altar with which is materializing this guy. So metal and this, bad. And it's gonna happen on the DM's turn. This thing is gonna arc like 1d4 times to you know, 1d4 metal targets. So it could be one target gets all four of the arcs and so on and forth. You see how that combination can work. So this thing is drawn to metal and it's If too much time passes in here, um, you could also have the Elder God to deal with. And he has spells and powers that are, you know, almost they're all like wishes and stuff. I mean, he's, he's insanely high level. Okay, now we have the isolation portals. That's the last one. So, as a free action, the Dark Lord can cast Isolation Portal. Now, if you have a group of, say, five players, I would give the Dark Lord two casts of Isolation Portal, free action, on his turn, every time it's his turn. What this spell does is it simply teleports a target to one of these little spots back here. You can probably see them from where you are. See that? A little platform back here. The only way to get out of here is to cruise along and then to climb up into this zone, which is where all the arcing and the chaos is, um, or to face these Shugoths, which guard these sort of side corridors. Now, another rule that you could make is you could say that actually these walls represent ceiling high walls. So this is an inescapable space right here. You can just add that element, or you can make it climb outable. But if you climb out and he's materializing, he's right there, tail attack, 10d10 damage, right? So the idea is to break the group up, force them to move, and then potentially have them deal with these Shugoths. Now, you're probably not gonna have a guy coming out of the isolation portal and fighting a Shugoth by himself, but they may have to exchange blows and pull away in a creative fashion. Okay, the Shugoth won't go much further than right here. Then they do some fighting, this stuff, this stuff happens, da, 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 an isolation portal again, and he's back here again. Oh crap, okay, well I gotta get down here again, and then I got you see what I mean? It's a classic mechanic as a way to split up a group to isolate them from each other and give them private little battles to fight. And don't make the Shugoths horribly deadly, but they should be a major pain in the butt. Maybe they entangle, maybe they grab like a uh, gelatinous cube does, and so on and so forth. Um, again, I'm just running with the sort of cthulhu -y theme because I happen to have all the awesome minis and I wanted to use them. So I put them in the end of this room set. So that's the whole battle, it's that simple. You get the Dark Lord slain, the ritual is interrupted, but the Elder God, even in a semi-material state, might still be enough that, you know, he, he's kind of a force to deal with. Maybe the characters have brought some explosives. They're actually going to destroy this thing so that it can never be, this ritual can never be done again. Maybe when the Dark Lord falls, the stability between fire and ice starts to break and these blasts of fire and ice start ripping through the structure. The ceiling is collapsing and they need to get the hell out of here through the Great Hall and escape. Maybe the last thing they see is the Elder God growing up huge and shattering the Citadel apart and go, ah, and then the forces of fire and ice skewer him and destroy him. Or maybe you took too long and he actually grows and becomes more material and the course of your world has changed. Maybe they don't defeat any of this stuff and they have to flee and they have to get reinforcements and return to the Citadel of Fire and Ice and then it's too late because this guy's materialized and whoo! Maybe they bring their own force. Maybe they have, they can enslave undead and they enter this room with their own army of undead. And so they do. We've come to stop your madness, Dark Lord. And we bring an army of the dead. You know, this, this battle could go any number of ways. And remember, the battles aren't what's awesome about the gameplay. It's what people do, players do, interpersonally and within their own growth and their own psychology that makes everything fascinating. Um, the battles are just a backdrop for role-playing, a backdrop for personal discovery, for danger and trauma. And so if the mechanics get too klutzy or too powerful or too overloading or overbearing, then ease them back. If your players are less RP style and more into just, you know, you know, drag out, beat down combat, then ramp up your mechanics and, and add or combine the mechanics that I'm proposing throughout the video. My gosh, I am, I don't know why I'm doing all these marathon things lately, but this is, this is a gigantic project that took a lot of work and I'm gonna give you a lot of time to look at my original journal entry here because it really does contain all the data quite cleanly. 
But building it in 3D, I think, gives you uh, a lot of confidence and a lot of people ability to visualize what kind of spaces you're going to be exploring through the course of maybe a couple of nights of gameplay. Um, and you know, just how much fun players can have confronting spaces of this nature and, and feeling this D&D kind of feel. Ah, that's my ending, I think. So wow, I just made a big mess in my whole room, had a great time with you guys. Finally got this off my chest. I've been thinking about these rooms and this intercombining door combination, fire, ice, elder god stuff for too long. So I'm glad it's out of my system finally. It's great to have everybody watching. Thanks. This video powered by Patreon. Everybody on Patreon, thank you so much for your ongoing support. We're going to keep making awesome D&D. And I'm going to keep on looking for more excuses to use my, um, my painted Cthulhu Wars miniatures because they look super, super cool. And all you do is a little bit of a dark wash, a little bit of a dry brush, and they, they fit right into the whole look. So, hell yeah, man. Keep it real. Don't steal. You always get a deal. Strength on our beer.